All right, we've connected. So, uh, first of all, thank you all for, for coming. I'm Matthew Urids from well, Silverdale Business. I'm the vice chair. Uh, and today with me is Lester DeVere from ABC Business Sales. Uh, just before we, we do get into the whole webinar, just a, a few little housekeeping things. So we, we do have uh, a little chat function on the right hand side of the screen as well as a Q&A section. So if you do have any questions, you can post your question in there, type it out, and we'll be able to get to those towards the end. Uh, but by all means, throw your questions in there and uh, we'll, we'll get to them for sure. So just before we, we do start getting getting into that, uh, I would like to, to thank Silverdale Business, Business Fire Pro, and Destination Aura Beach for, for helping put this together. Uh, it's a bit of a, well, I think this is the fifth webinar in the series now, and, and we don't really plan on, on stopping anytime soon. I think they, they offer quite a bit of value to the business community as a whole and, and even the, uh, the general the general population as well. So uh, I would like to, to thank Lester for, for coming on today and uh, cool. giving his little spiel as well as anyone else. Uh, if you are willing and wanting to, to showcase what you do, uh, by all means, get in touch with, with uh, Tasha at Silverdale Business. I'll, I'll throw her information into the chat as well and we can set something up. Uh, but Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Lester to start talking about basically how to value your business and plan for the future. Very cool. Look, I uh, thank you, Matt. I do appreciate being able to come on board. I recognise that um, COVID lockdown time is not necessarily an easy time for uh, for people, and um, even uh, making decisions to come and listen to this is really quite cool. So, uh, look, I lo I'd like this to be interactive. Um, it's a little bit awkward me sitting here talking to a screen, but uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, I'm quite comfortable with that. So uh, business sales, ABC business sales, uh, the, uh, uh, the oldest business sales broking company in New Zealand, been going 37 years. Uh, we have a representation nationwide. We have 65 active brokers, majority in Auckland, of course. Um, and within Auckland, we have two distinct areas um, separations. We've got hospitality, which deals with cafes, restaurants, and the hospitality trade, and the general team, which is everything other than those. Now, I'm part of the general team, and as such, I handle um, a lot of other general businesses, and that can be from retail to um, IT to import wholesale, um, print shops, everything. Um, so we get to we get to see really uh, it, it, it's such a privilege because we go donkey deep into everyone's businesses and you get a real overview of uh, how they run and that's really quite an important part uh, of establishing the value of a business. So look today I want to um, go over uh, how from outside looking in somebody values your business. And uh, it's something that you may have owned for a very long time, very proud of, and uh, are unsure of how uh, the process works. And I'll explain that in full. And also uh, creating a um, uh, creating a value to it is a process. There are steps that go through that, which is most important. So, in any uh, in any valuation. We what we do what it's called a discovery process. Now that discovery process is very important. Um, preferably, it's done face to face. It's where I would sit in front of you, the owner or the owners of any business, and talk about your business, find out what it is you've created, how long you've been doing it, uh, and a lot of detail around it because all that adds up to creating uh, a valuation for you. And uh, typically in that discovery session, uh, wanting to find out what the owners do. Um, so your role as a business owner is very important because there are three questions that any buyer asks. They always ask, what have they got to know to run your business? That's around the IP, the uh, how it operates um, and what experience or knowledge they need to be able to run the business. 
uh, what I've got to do in the business. So that's the day-to-day -day operational stuff. Um, what do they? Uh, what are they required to do in time-wise from a time commitment? So how many hours do they, do you put into your business? Uh, and what am I going to earn? So those are the three big questions that somebody is going to ask in any sale of any business. What I've got to know, what have I got to do, what am I going to earn? And so to answer those questions, uh, we have to go through that process. So um, the big one here is the correlation between what have I got to do in the business and what am I going to earn? So um, if you relate it to like the, to, to this example here, if as a uh, an owner of a business, you're putting um, 40 hours a week into the business, which is fairly normal for an owner operator. If you're putting 40 hours into the week, you know, in your business and you're pulling out 100K, um, that has a connotation of an expectation around value. Um, for, for somebody. If you own that business and you're earning 100K, but you're doing two days a week or you're doing one day a week, the value changes quite substantially because it is going from an owner operator to a semi managed or a fully managed operation. And so the criteria changes significantly around that. And so that. Um, what have I got to do to run the business is really quite a big and important question. And if there are two of you operating, if you're a husband and wife in the business, those roles need to be defined. Um, I find a lot of couples who run the business, no issues with that at all. Uh, it's quite typical, in fact. Um, small business in New Zealand is run by husband and wife teams quite a bit. Uh, so if one of those roles is an admin type role, um, we have to take that into account because if, if for example, um, the, uh, well, you know, I'll typify it here. If the husband is working 40 hours a week and um, a, a wife, spouse, partner, whatever, is doing 20 hours a week in an admin role, a business is generally valued on a one working owner. Okay, now understand that one working owner is quite important. Um, often I get couples who say, well, look, we're looking for a couple to buy the business. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, the valuation of a business is based around one working owner. And so if the business is um, earning that couple 100,000 collectively, we would take uh, we would allocate in general for an admin role around 35,000 a year. So we would take 35,000 off that value and the business would be valued back at that 65. Okay. So I'll go into that kind of detail, but that's uh, understanding that um, a working owner is how a business is primarily valued. And that's, that's, that's important. And so in that discovery session, we're looking at, how long you've been in business. Uh, we're looking at where the business is located. We're looking at what the working owner earns from the business. And we're looking at details like if lease is relevant. If you operate from premises, we want to look at the lease. We want to see uh, what the relationship is like with the landlord. Uh, we want to see um, how long that lease is going. And leases are a very important part to all business, as you can imagine. And and clearly, a lot of this has to do with the numbers. We've got to look at the numbers. We are basically lifting the lid uh, to see and go donkey deep into the numbers so we can create a value for the business. And that will be uh, really the biggest point that most people are looking at, at, at a business. What would you pay to earn X amount? That is a question that a lot of um, vendors that I've got to ask a lot of vendors when we come to a value on, on a business. So um, traditionally, how a business is valued uh, in, in, uh, in, in a general business um, situation, we have multipliers that are applied to the sale of a business. Those multipliers vary depending on the information that we collate. And so... Uh, to give you an example of a multiplier, if uh, you had a retail shop uh, in the main street 
and um, you were an owner operator and um, you had a couple of staff, part-time staff. And um, for example, actually I'll give you a real, a real world example here. Okay, so if you were a hairdresser working uh, in premises and you were the main person um, operating and the brand was you, but you had one or two people either side, the multiplier associated to that type of business could be a 1.1, 1.2 multiplier. Now, what that means is the return to the working owner, we'll call it, uh, we'll call it 100,000. If you uh, introduce a multiplier and it's a 1.2, the value of that business is 120,000. Okay, so that's how a multiplier works. If it was a two times multiplier, it would be 200,000. So how does a hairdresser or that role change at all. So it depends on how the business is run. So we've had situations where the hairdresser runs a salon and they've got eight seats, eight chairs. The owner of that salon doesn't work in the business, but they own the business and they manage it. And so the multiplier changes because the person is not so hands on. And if because of those increased chairs, the person is earning in stations from uh, 50,000 to 100,000 to 150 to 200,000, each of those increments changes the multiplier, okay? And so uh, in that instance, if the person is earning over 200,000, they would, their multiplier to that business would be uh, between two and 2.3, something like that. And so those valuations change. And so understanding that in New Zealand, business, businesses sell essentially on a multiplier basis. All accountants know that. Uh, and we have to make sure that when we're representing a business, the vendor's accountant and a buyer's accountant are more or less on the same page. To be honest, that doesn't happen that often. Often we will find a the disparity between a buyer's accountant and a vendor's accountant can be up to 30% variation, okay? Uh, and one's a little more positive, one's a little more cautious, and that's just the nature of it. That's just how it works. And so it's important to, uh, to understand that. And those multipliers are <coughs> very, greatly across the industry. So if anybody wants to get an idea um, of what multiplier is relevant for their industry, happy to engage. I can send you information. We've got industry papers. Um, we've done, we, we've got a reasonable amount of analysis across a broad spectrum of New Zealand industry and, and, and small businesses. So happy to help there. That would be really quite cool to be able to do that. Uh, and so once you've got the, uh, once you've got the your, your head around how a business is valued, you've got to then think, okay, so uh, how does that affect what my next steps are? And um, if you are in business and you're really happy in the business that you've got and you have no intention of selling for a while, you still need to know how your business is valued from outside in because that may help shape how you change things going forward. Now, typically I will have a, uh, a bit of a pipeline of businesses that intend to sell. So that pipeline may not necessarily be full, but it's very long. So um, I'm about to list a business uh, in the Milford Takapuna area. It's going to, sorry, it's going to go live. We've listed the business. It's gonna go live within the next 24 hours. I've been working with them for 18 months. And over the, this is a retail shop. And over those 18 months, they have changed their systems amazingly. And instead of a uh, owner operator working six days a week, which is what she was doing, she now has choice and option and is just doing two or three days because of the way that she's changed the whole system on discussions around how somebody outside looking in values that business. 
And so what she has done, uh, she has a reasonable amount of stock. She's barcoded that stock, brought in a barcode system. She's brought in Vend as a software system, which accounts for stock and all sales. Um, zero is obvious. Uh, and so she has, through technical upgrades, changed the way the actual business runs and she has bought somebody in as a store manager four days a week. And her sales are skyrocketing. It's really cool. It's really cool. And because she now has the management of the business so much more in control, that's created a whole heap of freedom that she previously didn't have. So within the last 18 months, uh, her return to a working owner has gone from uh, 110,000 to 195,000. How's that? And that's through step by step changing the systems. And that is something that doesn't happen overnight. So, um, you know, a business sale, if you decide to sell, hey, look, we're going to sell next week. No, you don't need to do that. It's a process that you've got to go through because the more sale ready your business is, the better the return you're going to get. And the better it's actually going to perform on a month by month basis because you are already fine tunely aware of how the business could reach its potential because you're more focused around how somebody's looking at it from outside in. And that makes a hell of a difference, it makes a difference. And it's quite positive too, to go through that process. Um, look, I was in my own business for 30 years. I understand what it's like to uh, just focus in the business instead of working on the business. And uh, yeah, it, it's something that I think everyone would benefit from. And so, um, you know, looking at planning for the future is, um, it's something that really everybody can benefit from by having some external eyes coming in to have a look. Um, so it's in that we started off by talking about a discovery process. That's where I would come into the business to find out what it is, what your roles are, how you do things, talk about stock, talk about the lease, talk about everything like that and look at the numbers. And that from there, we do an appraisal, and that appraisal is based around looking at your numbers, preferably for the last three financial years and year to date. And that gives us a fairly clear idea as to trends, uh, where things are working. Uh, if it's trending up, a business is always easier to sell. If it's trending down, there are always questions that are going to be asked. And those questions are... Um, Obviously, very important to be answered, and there is usually a reason for everything. That's obvious. COVID has been a huge one. Businesses through COVID have either succeeded and done well, disproportionately so in some instances. I uh, sold a business, uh, settled 31st of July. In the first lockdown in 2020, the owner purchased a Tesla through the profits just by COVID. Go figure. How's that? Uh, online businesses this was one of them, did amazingly well. Everybody is now um, a hell of a lot more comfortable around online purchasing, and that trend we don't see changing. Um, the, the with, with being locked down, um, heaven help us, you know, novelty's worn off on this one, get it. Um, but through that process, we know that there is an upside. We know coming out the other side that life still exists and business will carry on and business will, um, yeah, there's, there's no stopping us. First time round, there's a little more hesitancy. People weren't aware of what's going on, but this time round, um, to give you examples, um, our, we measure how much uh, activity is out there by the number of confidentiality agreements we get signed off. So typically when a business lists and goes live, uh, for anybody to find out about the um, business, uh, we have a confidentiality agreement that needs to be signed off. So um, in this lockdown, the confident, number of confidentiality agreements um, is a little bit softer than normal, which is not unusual, but it's nowhere near as soft as it was last lockdown. And so people are sitting at home, bored, brainless, um, 
novelty is worn off stroking the cat and so they're looking at how they can uh, engage and uh, see what else see what other options are out there and transactions that we've had going on haven't stopped if uh, people are interested they're interested because they know that um, there is an end game to this um, lockdown process so that's 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 important um, but yeah getting back to that appraisal uh, getting an appraisal done uh, there is no cost to that but it gives you a real world feel as to where your business is at and uh, that is something that I think most businesses owner most business owners would benefit a lot from that and that um, it doesn't matter if you deal with stock or you're dealing with the service, same thing applies. If you're dealing with the service, uh, re, you know, finding a replacement could be difficult if the business is about you, if it's named after you and all the rest of it, that creates a, a, a different strategy. And that is where you've got to start looking at how the business is run. So typically if um, somebody, uh, gives me a call, wants me to come and review their opportunity and the business is all about them. We have to work out a way how to reduce your time in the business. Okay. And it doesn't matter how long that takes, but um, okay, I've got a friend who does 60 hours a week. Now he knows 60 hours a week, seven days a week. Who, the, who, who wants to buy that? No, people aren't into that kind of um, business opportunity. So uh, what he has to do, and he's very aware of it, he's got to get a manager in, he's got to get people in who can take up some of that role so that as the business owner, he works less in it. It's, it's not rocket science, it's understandable, but to actually go through that process can take time. And so businesses that sell, that must sell, that need to sell urgently, it doesn't kind of help that process. Um, yeah, I, I've met, uh, so I've uh, been a business broker for six years with ABC now, and I've met a lot of uh, uh, business owners who need to sell. And that may be around a, uh, a health concern, totally understandable, totally relatable, but um, if businesses need to sell and sell quickly, um, a buyer, human nature, unfortunately, if it's not the buyer, it could be their advisors, usually come in and want to slash and burn and um, see if they can pick up a bargain, which doesn't help anyone. So the more advanced uh, you are down the track of how a business sells, makes you well informed, makes you a, a lot more relevant to the market. Um, and it's always outside looking in, that is the best, uh, best scenario, to be honest. Um, any questions out there? Have I glossed over something that you'd want to know a little bit more about? Um, is there, are, are there any basic things that I can help with? Because uh, I'd certainly love to be able to do that if I can. Well, while we're waiting for someone to, to pop Come up. a question in the Q&A, <laughs> yeah. I have one that might not be <laughs> overly basic, but uh, it, it goes back to the industry multipliers and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, is there kind of a, a cheat cheat sheet uh, to help us sort of quickly <laughs> identify a, a multiplier that we should be looking at? Because you mentioned the the first example, I think you said 1.2 yeah. is a multiplier, and then yeah. you're talking about uh, the hairdresser with multiple seats where they're just the, effectively managing the day-to-day -day operation yeah. as opposed to <clears throat> day-to-day being as high as like 2.3, 2.4 sort of thing. So yeah. what what is the big indicator to say it's 1.2 versus 2.3? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, <clears throat> if uh, it is industry specific, I have to say, okay? So I deal with a lot of online businesses. I've sold quite a number at ABC. And um, what is attractive about an online business is that uh, there's no lease. It can be work. It can be done from home, uh, and therefore the amount of time you put into it is relative to what you're selling and who's picking and packing. If that's if you're selling a product, uh, so when I say it's industry specific, if it's an online business, um, it's automatically going to start with something uh, two point three and above. 
Right. If that online business, the best online business I've sold, gave me a 3.6. Now, when you're, if you look at an example of 100K going from a two, say a two, to a three, is the difference between 200 and 300,000. If you get from 100K and you go to 3.6, it's kind of starting to add up. And so that, uh, yeah, that, it's relative to the industry sector, I have to say. To give you a cheat sheet, I'd be doing you a disservice. Um, a, a lot of accountants will generally adapt and uh, adopt a three times multiplier, which is actually quite wrong. Um, and that may inflate somebody's value of their business. Um, but to, in general, say a three times multiplier is what you're looking at is not right. Um, and it is relative to what the person is earning as the working owner. So we've got a question here. How does it work with goodwill as I run service a service business? Okay, so <clears throat> thank you for that question. Really cool. So um, that's a very good question. In the sale of any business, there are three, three things that we look at. Tangibles. The tangibles are the depreciated value of the goods, uh, of the um, infrastructure around you that help you do the business. So tangibles in um, in an office or a professional uh, situation would be the desks, the chairs, computers, that sort of stuff. If you're running a mechanical workshop, it would be all the tools. It would be, well, no, most mechanics have their own tools, but it would be the, the, um, the big stuff uh the hoists all that sort of thing and those tangibles your accountant has depreciated over the years so if you run a service business um if you're able to tell me um okay uh auckland garden services is that right uh yeah 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 okay so uh um All right, so you may well have quite a few tangibles, but if they've been depreciated depreciated over time, uh, the depreciated value is uh, is what a business sells as opposed to the market value, big difference. So if it's depreciated value, please understand that that is the book value, the depreciated value over time. And so your accountant, you can't steal the money twice as far as the tax department are concerned. So the depreciated value of your gear, you've been creating a tax advantage through the years. And so it can be quite a low figure, even though you feel, hey, you know, I've got all this gear. Yeah, I know, but uh, your accountant's been depreciating it over quite a period of time. And so that's important. The next one is the goodwill factor which is the intangible. So we call that intangible. The intangible value is this multiplier that we're talking about. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to that about the goodwill. And the third one is, of course, stock. So if you've got stock relative to the sale, um, that's also part of the equation. So those three things make up a total price. The biggest is always going to be the intangible or the goodwill factor. And so, uh, if you're in uh, if you're in landscape business, if you are in a uh, property maintenance business, if you are in that kind of field, you are going to have a multiplier that is relevant to that industry. Now, that multiplier is generally lawnmower business, so repeated service. Okay, gotcha. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, if you, in your, in in that particular industry, you are looking at, um, you've got a a, a really cool repeat clientele, which is excellent. So you're essentially selling a, a, a bunch of clients to a new owner. And so that is, uh, that's really good. I like that. And so your uh, lawn mowing business, so your assets, uh, if you're going to include the vehicle because it's been specifically uh, configured for ease of um, 
carrying stuff, that will very much be part of the sale. And chances are you might have your branding on that. So that would be part of the sale. If you've had the vehicle for a long time, the uh, value of it, depreciated value, uh, unfortunately might be quite low, depending on how old the vehicle is. Um, and you're going to have gear that's in there. And so your tangible will be one figure. Uh, your intangible is the is, is the main figure. So if you're in lawn mowing services, the other equation that we've got to take into account are the barriers to entry. So you've got a repeat service clientele, which is highly valuable. The barrier to entry is quite low because uh, conceivably somebody can um, buy a certain amount of gear and go out and start up in opposition. And so the multiplier associated to that industry is generally between 1.5 and uh, mid twos. And that is relative to what uh, you earn as a working owner. And so uh, when you earn a certain amount, we can apply a multiplier to that amount. And that is the goodwill factor. Okay, so tangibles, I've covered that. You've got that one well and truly sorted. The goodwill factor or the intangibles is what you're after. And so that is the multiplier that would be associated with that business. And it is relative to um, how much business you've actually got and how long you've been in operation. Uh, look, it's a little bit like here. Once we come out of a lockdown, boom, you're backed up for Africa. I've got a couple of mates who... Uh, who are in um, garden and property services, and uh, they they're, they're chocker through to the end of the year, looking at work for next year, and so it's good business and it's a repeat client, which is really cool. So I hope that's covered uh, a little bit about that. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, so that uh, that that breakdown is important to know also how a sale works. So um, yeah, it's always those three: tangibles, intangibles, or goodwill, and stock. Um, yep. So that's that's that one. A so, bit of a selfish question. <laughs> Go uh, for it. <laughs> it's got to be. I mean, it's got to be relevant. It, it, it is. So, I I personally uh, have looked at purchasing a business, uh, and, yep. and for those that that don't know, I'm I'm in the the web development and digital marketing industry. So there's there's a lot of I guess personal knowledge sort of stuff that goes into that as well. Uh, and they also seem like dime a dozen, uh, to be completely honest. Uh, yeah. But you will often see listed for sale something like a book of clients. So it's where the business itself isn't being sold. They're just getting rid of their clients. They want to keep the name and so forth. Yeah. How do you look at valuing that compared to the whole business, including the name? Yep, there's, ver there's a marked difference between the two, okay? Yep. Uh, for somebody just to sell off, um, I've, I've come across this, Matt, I've come across this. Um, and again, um, really, if somebody, if a business owner wants to keep the name but just sell the clients, they want to get a chunk of change for a group of clients, there's no loyalty in that. The, the reality is New Zealand businesses uh, do not have contracts. They have uh, potentially a preferred supplier agreement. They have a handshake. They have they get business through a referral. But there are no contracts. There are very few contracts in small businesses. We just become a preferred supplier. And there's no guarantee to that. Okay? So... If you want to tell me that you've got, say, 50 clients and you want to sell that book of 50 clients but keep hold of your name, um, there's, there's there's very little value in that. You can tell me what those 50 clients get, get for you. There's going to be a, a basic rule where those clients may test your product once if they don't like you or there is an issue, they may not come back. There's no guarantee. When you have contracted business, that creates a difference because you can then uh, sell the company on and the clients are contracted to that company, which makes a big difference. Whereas um, in your particular industry, uh, digital, um, 
the hardest part in your industry, Matt, is uh, maintaining employees because they're not very faithful. Um, somebody offers to pay them a little bit more and they will tend to jump. Um, and it's a little bit hard to keep hold of staff. Um, and making that transition from a home operation to working from premises makes a big difference. If you are a home operator and you've uh, got one or two employees and then you move to premises, you take that name and you expand that and then you end up with 10 or 12, you're, you're creating a different model, you're creating a different beast. And it's when you do that, the multiplier changes because your clients are more likely to stick with you because you've created this big infrastructure and you aren't or you shouldn't be working as many hours as you used to when you were operating from home. <laughs> Me, eh? No, that, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty much as I expected, but yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's good getting clarification. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like the tradies at the moment, we've had, uh, here's an interesting one. So uh, the construction industry, as we hear, is booming, right? It's in peril. It's in big trouble because there's no freaking supplies. And yeah. so uh, we have had construction companies for sale and there's been no interest uh, because uh, the tradies are so busy themselves, they haven't got time to look at anything else. But also some of these big operations are having such supply issues that they're in trouble. And it's, 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 it's not a pretty thing. And finding tradies who are, um, uh, they're in such hot demand that they're pretty much able to, um, you know, command their own hourly rate, which is, which is not helping the industry. So th there's a lot of stuff going on, which is, 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 is difficult. So within each sector, what I'm saying here is that within each sector, there are different issues around uh, understanding where the industry is at. And when you put a business up for sale, um, people, they, I, they, there's, there's, you, you cannot hide anything. Um, the difference between selling real estate, a house, and selling a business is massive. It is massive. Selling a house, um, if you get uh, all the limb reports, if you get a building inspector in, someone goes in, kicks the tires, they get a feel, and more importantly, the new owners love the feel of the house. Um, and it's bricks and mortar. Buying a business, you're buying what's in somebody's head. And so the amount of due diligence is a lot more intense. And if you don't find the right fit, it's a tricky one. And uh, it's very important that any business owner knows that if they try and hide something, it's going to come out in due diligence because that's when everything gets scrutinized. And the difficulty there. It's quite simply this. Doubt creates questions. If questions can't be answered, it creates hesitation and it creates inaction. All right. So um, when I'm representing a business, I want to know what the weakest link is straight away so that I can answer that because it will be found out. And if you answer that and front foot that, you're then going to get a lot happier purchaser going through that process. Because you'll understand this, when somebody decides to buy your business and they sign off that bit of paper and you have that bit of paper put in front of you, the whole decision goes from logic and sense to emotion. A buyer has seen that they want to engage in your business. They can see themselves running it. And nobody, to be honest, wants to run the business as you've run it. They want to see the potential in it and they want to know how to grow it. Okay. People, nine times out of 10, aren't happy with the status quo. They want to be able to grow the business to make it earn more money. It's very cool. And the reason why it's emotional is because the vendor has already worked out what they're going to do, what their exit strategy is. And that has started quite simply from a reason to sell to a reality around, oh, my God, honey, we're going to be able to move on, go on in a different path, retire, 
go somewhere, do something. And so it becomes quite emotional. And so in that in that particular state, you do not want a situation where um, they suddenly discover something that they weren't aware of. Because if they do, bam, it creates doubt. And that doubt suddenly becomes caution. And you're going to bet your bottom dollar that a buyer's accountant and a buyer's lawyer are going to go, oh, not too sure, not too sure, because they're, that is their role to be cautious. Yep. No, a business right. owner is the one who puts the line in the sand. They're the ones who have got the gumption to make that step. Everybody else is going to be cautious, you know. Um, so is restraint uh, – question, thank you. Is restraint of trade on the vendor still common? It's incredibly common. Thank you. Awesome question. <laughs> That's a great question. <clears throat> so in a sale and purchase agreement, the main considerations are the price, obviously, settlement date, how long somebody wants to settle, restraint of trade, landlord consent, and finance and due diligence. Okay, so there's a few there. Uh, due diligence is when somebody goes into the business, make sure it is what we've purported it to be. Make sure that the numbers are right. Finance, that's where somebody's going in to make sure, uh, okay, uh, they can afford to buy the business or um, the finance is being approved. Landlord consent, if there's a lease involved, the landlord has quite a strong play in this. Um, landlord consent can take as long as uh, any of the other conditions because they want to verify that the person is going to be of worth, that they're able to take over the business and operate it. Because if they don't and it falls over, they're exposed. And so that can be an issue. Restraint of trade is a biggie. It's really quite important. Um, if you buy a business, uh, okay, if you're selling your business and, um, okay, here's a classic. Here's a classic. Here's a real example of restraint of trade. I uh, had a client five years ago, was an interior decorator. She um, had a bricks and mortar business for sale and she uh, was good at what she did and she had clients predominantly in Auckland but also had clients in Tauranga and other parts of the country. Okay, so in the restraint of trade clause, she um, had exclusions of being able to trade uh, in any other part other than Auckland. And so if I'm buying the business, I'm thinking, okay, so I'm paying a chunk of change for that brand. I'm paying a chunk of change to be able to run the business as it was running but you're telling me that you still want to operate. And so what's going to stop somebody, uh, say, in Auckland saying, oh, could you just come and do this for me? Hmm, no, 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 no. Um, there is no way that uh, a buyer is going to allow that because if they're paying a fair amount for the business in the goodwill of the business and in the intangibles of that business, they want to be able to run it absolutely how it was run. So, yes, uh, restraint of trade is massive. So legally, what's enforceable is around two, three years. A lot of um, buyers want five years for a restraint of trade and being able to operate. If you operate an online business that can sell anywhere, New Zealand worldwide, you are going to want to put a boom worldwide restraint of trade on that vendor because um, if they operate in that same industry, with a different name, uh, actually restraint of trade even covers the children of the owners. Um, most people aren't aware of that. But um, if you're buying a business, you want to make sure you are protecting the ability to trade and to stop the vendor from transacting in that same um, in that same field. Otherwise, you lose all the value that you've paid for, depending on what that is. So, very good question. A restraint of trade is still very relevant, and it's part of the. Auckland District Law Society sale and purchase agreement. Um, so yes, that is a that is a big consideration. Good question, thank you. What else can I talk about here, Matt? <clears throat> um, I, I did have another question. That's more. Oh, along, you're a tiger, eh? Uh, it, it's more more along <clears throat> what 
what I've picked up from what you're saying, because it, mm -hmm. it does sound a lot like you almost have a, a, a business coach type element when someone comes yeah. on board and says, I want to sell. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, because yeah. you you, you yeah. mentioned the 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 business that's just going up in the next twenty four hours the yeah. the retail shop they've gone through a massive transition huge transition but how many or how often do you find that you've taken someone through that and then all of a sudden they decide actually this business is going well I'm not going to sell now <laughs> absolutely and so uh, yeah and and I don't have an issue with that at all. I really enjoy helping business for the sake of helping business. Um, uh, I'm quite an emotional broker. Um, I like to see uh, I like to see success, and it, it it doesn't it doesn't really matter, you know. Um, I like to see people doing well and reaching goals, and so these people have made a massive transition in their business. They have already sold their property in Auckland, they're renting, they have bought in Nelson. Uh, they have made the decision to move. Okay, another case here for you. This is cool. I, I, can't, uh, I think it's quite relatable if I speak about specific businesses because I think that's, that's relatable in itself. So uh, we had a business that did not sell last year. It's worth one point. Uh, we were asking 1.9 million for it. We had an offer come up uh, on for 1.8, and she was prepared to sell, which is cool. the The sale fell through because the buyer was also at the same time looking at a similar business, same sort of value, but he preferred her business, and he wanted her business. The other business that he was looking at they dropped the sale price significantly and we're talking by a third and so he could not walk past that okay he could not walk past that and so he has purchased that business and my client is left holding her business at 1.8 and wondering what's happening here and so i had quite a strong discussion with her around why she wants to sell and if a vendor does not have a convincing answer as to why they want to sell, they're not going to sell. And how do I come to that conclusion? Because this person is in their mid 50s, they don't want to retire, they want a chunk of change, but if they keep doing what they're doing, they can earn big money, they can earn a good living. And they, they're, they're pulling out, that's the term we use, is to, you know, pulling out, dropping out. Uh, dropping out over uh, 450000 a year. So why would you give that up? And this is something that she's got to come to terms with, even though she originally wanted to sell, those were for different reasons, her emotional circumstances have changed, now she's not sure if she wants to. So if I go to her with a sale and purchase agreement for 1.8, and she doesn't know what she wants to do, I've had it before, they're not going to sell I was trying to sell an IT company uh, six years ago, um, and the uh, you know I had a sale and purchase there at full price, and the person didn't sign it because they didn't know what they're going to do. And so, uh, understanding what the vendor wants to do in their lives is a big one. So, I want to cover all the emotional reasons. I want to find out how long they've run the business, why they run the business, how they got into it, who's involved in it. Um, I like getting really personal with my people so that when people ask questions about the business and specifically about the business owner, I can answer with integrity. Not sure if that answered your question, but it felt good. Uh, it, it did. Um, I, I do have someone who has kind of asked to come onto the stage as well to ask that cool. question or, or uh, however it is. So I'm just going to, to hand over the mic. Perfect. Yeah, so it might take a second and oh this is great Let, linda you're you're on can you hear me okay i can. can linda how are you good thank you good may i ask a question about purchasing a business please yes of course, of course. Is that valid? okay yeah 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 very relevant good okay pause um 
I'm actually looking at that right now, and all I've been given at this particular point is um, a brief five-page information memorandum. Yes. Uh, so I know who the business is, where it is, all of that. I know about the lease. I've got a sales summary for three years running. Yep. 2019, 20, and 21. Yes. Um, as tangible assets included, which are desk, chairs, units, monitors, computers, co couch, printer, all of that sort of thing, and a price. And then I've been supplied a profit and loss statement for ending 21 March 21. Yes. And then I've got another bit of some sort of statistics here which is doing my head and I'm trying my best to understand those uh, but it's only based on a week so um, okay. and that's to do with income and you know various aspects of what this is I, I don't mind saying it's about a purchasing a rent rent roll if you like oh yep yeah. okay yep, so yep, what yep. other pertinent questions do you think I should find out what else can I find or what kind of information should I be trying to look for yeah, for sure. So that mm. information memorandum that you've got is generally a high level uh, information to sort out the wheat from the chaff as to who actually is interested and yep. what uh, questions they want to, uh, or if, if it's of interest to them. And so yep. we would we would call that an executive summary. It is very much a summary, yes. Yeah, for sure. And so really yep. um, for you to create a value and for anybody to create a value on a business, it's really quite important for you to look at a month by month summary for the last couple of years so you can see if there's any seasonality into the income. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very relevant to see how businesses peak and flow through uh, a year and specifically through a COVID environment. True. And that way you can also, that will help you give you an idea around cash flow because cash flow is really important. Cash flow is king. Um, yep. And what you're looking at isn't involving stock, which is particularly useful in this time because stock is a nightmare. Sure. Uh, and so that is good. And with a rent roll like that, I mean, um, you know, I can see that uh, you're with Quinovic. Um, and I hope that's okay for me to say that. Yep. So uh, you're perfectly placed to um, be able to handle that sort of uh, uh, engagement. You've got the right skill set and you've got the right infrastructure around you to take that on. And so good yeah. on you. That's really cool. And uh, those are contracted uh, businesses. And so you do have a, a, a more guaranteed um, recurring income which is really good. Uh, and so you've got to review those month by month and uh, it should be a cash flow positive business. And so you should be able to, uh, your, your working capital requirement after purchase price should be minimal, if anything. And that's the main criteria. But um, if you like the business, if you like the feel of the business, if it's, within a investment window that you're comfortable with, you're best to get a, uh, an accountant on board to help you understand more about the numbers. So I would certainly get um, uh, deeper information. You would have signed off a confidentiality agreement, I take it? Yes, correct. Okay, so that confidentiality agreement that you've signed allows you to bring professional advisors on board that they don't have to sign off again. So it's just between uh, you and your advisors, you can look at all information that uh, people send you. Right. Um, so really it's understanding, um, have you, I take it you haven't met the owner? No, I know who that person is though. I Well actually, no, that's not true. I have met the owner. Okay. For about okay. three or four minutes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Ago. Many okay. months. Ago. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, um, You've got to you've, you've got to re-engage, and uh, I think there's nothing better than sitting down in front of an owner and finding out uh, a lot more about the business because you're picking up a lot more information 
uh, than what they're actually just saying as well. You're picking up attitude, you're picking up whether you can work with the person and whether or not a vendor assistance period, which is very important in a business sale, is going to go smoothly for you for a transitional um, process. Uh, and in something like a rent roll, it depends on whether they have... So, so how many people operate in the business? Two. Husband Two. and wife. Okay. Cool. Funny that. Uh, so she's, she's full-time and the husband's yep. actually the part-timer. There you go. Okay. Cool. So yep. um, if, you, if you take that on, um, you've got to decide... Um, how much of those roles you can do yourself or whether you're going to need assistance uh, in that process. And you've got to put a value to that process. Uh, or if you have the infrastructure where you are and you've got people who have capacity to take on that role, that's definitely um, a, a, a cost-effective um, way of, of, of making more money out of that because you're, uh, you know, the economies of scale should kick in. Right. Very good. Um, so, yeah, so to be honest, if you've got, if your accountant is somebody who has looked at business sales, has a, um, uh, a good handle around business sales, that's Thank really you. important. That's, <laughs> and that, okay, that's, that's cool. Yep. In that case, um, you would be very wise to get them on board once you've asked for deeper financial information yep. and uh, that shows integrity around the process. Okay, thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Look so uh, it doesn't look like we've had any other questions come through. So uh, that's okay. Um, do you do you have any sort of last words before we we sort of rock and roll? This up? For sure. Uh, I'm really impressed that my cat Zazu hasn't come up and smudged the screen. She normally does. <laughs> Uh, no, look, just in review, basically any business owner needs to understand how somebody outside looking in looks at their business. And if that, if you want to have a chat around that, happy to do so. If you want a Zoom meeting, if you want me to come up and say day when we're out of this, you know, happy to do all that because I think that's, uh, it's, it's powerful for people to know uh, what your industry multiplier might look like. Yes. So what you're actually earning and how somebody is going to value your business. That, and, that and you, don't have to be in, you don't have to be in sale mode. It, it's, you know. It works quite in with my, my next question, which was uh, how, how can people get in touch with you if, if they want to have this uh, the next sure. chat down the line? Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I am on the um, Silverdale business uh, website there. Um, but, yeah, Lester Devere, ABC Business Sales. I'm the only Lester in the in the company, so not too hard to uh, find there. But um, yeah, Lester D A B C Business .co .nz. Um, There's no point in me rattling off a mobile, but happy to. Um, what's what's the normal way of handling that, Matt? Well, well normally I, I just uh, what, whatever is your preferred method, and then I do that and throw all, all your contacts in the in the chat there. Holy <laughs> Toledo, that's awesome. Uh, Okay, so somebody's just coming. Uh, so, how are you? How are you going for time, Matt? Oh, that, that's that's fine. We can we can answer uh, Chris, Chris's question. Yeah, sure. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So, Chris, uh, would you be able to speak a little on the process you take to engage with a seller? Uh, good question. Thank you. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> it's about getting comfort for a vendor around who is engaging with them. Okay, and so a face-to-face -face meeting is good. That's we go through a discovery process uh, to engage with a seller. So I'm, I'm taking you. I'm, I'm taking. I'm, I'm assuming here. Uh, would you be able to speak a little on the process you take to engage with a seller? Okay, so um, foreign client. Yeah, so legally we have a listing authority that needs to be signed off, which legally gives us the ability to sell your business. And it's a process where um, at any stage and every stage through the process, you get to uh, see, authorize and sign off every stage of the process before going live. So I've got these people who are selling, we're about to go live 
at every stage, they have signed off the information memorandum, the business profile. They've signed off the web advertising that we're doing, which is a first view for people. They understand that there is going to be a confidentiality agreement uh, that everybody's got to sign off. There are different levels to that. So for their comfort, I'm going to give them every name of every person that wants to look at their business for sale so they can say yes or no to receiving the details of their business because it's been their baby for so long that um, they're very conscious that they don't want to upset clients or staff or anything like that. So that's that's what that's going to be. So at the initial stages, there is a listing authority which is required to be signed off where we agree to um, uh, we agree a value that we're going to put to the business after we've done an appraisal. And so there's no cost for that appraisal, but we go through, build up a relationship around um, how we're going to bring the business to the market and whether it's going to be named or not. 90, I'd say 95% of businesses aren't named. Uh, and once we've done the sign off, once we've agreed to whole processes that you sign off, we can then go live. So um, yeah, every seller is engaged fully all the way through the process to make sure that they're happy with how it's going to be done. Hundred percent. So, so Chris has followed up and just said that the the question was to understand what preparation we as as a business owner need to make uh, before getting in touch with a with a broker, basically. Oh, okay. Um, well, to be honest, it, it, it's depending on where you are. All of um, how do you prepare a business for sale, basically? Uh, and before anything is signed off, uh, it would be it, how long's a piece of string? So, uh, with this business that I'm selling, I've been engaged with them for eighteen months. So, um, I would come and have a look at your operation, and then say, okay, how to improve it? Let's look at ways to improve it. If the numbers are um, stacking up for you and it's looking really um, attractive outside looking in, you may not have to do too much at all. Um, if you're not too sure uh, how, how that is looking or if you think there might be ways to improve it, we can engage on that and just have a discussion around that uh, and see if, uh, see if, if what timing is going to be best for the business and uh, what timing is relevant for you as the business owner. Um, yeah, so it's how business, how sale really is the business uh, is, a, is a question that I would certainly ask. Fair enough. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, he's come back and said, I guess your advice and yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Cool. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, it was it was good cool. uh, pulling information out, out of Lester. I, I definitely found it useful. Uh, I I've never sat here and looked at myself so much in all my life. <laughs> <laughs> would it at least would have been good to see the faces, but that's okay. Uh, that, that, <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine. This this is how we can get it across to everyone. So. Yeah, yeah. We will be we will be downloading this and putting it up on YouTube. So if there are bits that you want to go back to and review again, you will be able to. Uh, so that will go up on the Silverdale Business YouTube channel, so you can get to it that way. Uh, just search Silverdale Business in YouTube. Other than that, I have popped Lester's contact information in the chat there. So if you Look want to. Uh, just copy that and get in touch with him for uh, industry multipliers. Uh, to be honest, I'm I'm going to be doing that myself. <laughs> <laughs> but before before we ended up, I, I do want to say thank you again to Lester for for taking the time cool. and, and going into so much detail for us all, as well as Silverdell Business, Business Farm Pro, and Destination Oreo Beach for for having this uh, been able to put on. Awesome. Thank you all. Excellent. Thank you.